Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for our pre-recorded Drone Safety Day webinar series. Drone Safety Day is aimed at promoting safe drone practices and exploring the cool and innovative ways drones are being used across Canada. My name is Shaheen Chohan and I'm a policy analyst working on the remotely piloted aircraft systems or drone task force at Transport Canada. Transport Canada is the department of the federal government responsible for regulating and developing transportation policies and programs, including those relating to drones. I'm joined by Mark Winnenberg, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at Drone Delivery Canada, a drone manufacturer specialized in logistics and delivery. Hi Mark, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I guess we'll start off with learning a little bit more about uh, Drone Delivery Canada or DDC's drone operations. So how do you use drones in your operations? So from uh, at DDC we use uh, drones to provide uh, logistical solutions uh, to areas that are either uh, underserved or haven't been thought of yet with regards to uh, delivery of goods and services. Now, this can either be something for societal benefits, uh, delivering medicines, supplies, things like that, uh, serving um, uh, underserved communities, or it could be something on the, uh, on the business side or commercial side of being able to deliver a product uh, uh, faster to, uh, to a customer. Sounds like you guys have a bunch of different use cases and applications. We do. <laughs> how, how long have you been using drones in these different capacities for? Uh, drone Delivery Canada has been using drones since 2014 uh, in, in various capacities. Uh, but since then, we've hit some key milestones in, in, in our company activities. Uh, that includes uh, the development of our patented uh, flight management system, which is the system, uh, it's an end-to-end -end system for software and hardware that basically tracks aircraft maintenance, package deliveries, flight planning, uh, weather, everything that's needed from the start to the finish of a, of a drone flight. It took a few years, but that, that system has been developed. Uh, we've also uh, worked on the development of three different uh, remotely piloted aircraft systems uh, used depending on the use case uh, of, the, uh, of the mission we're looking at. And finally, probably the last couple of years, we participated in the uh, Transport Canada uh, Beyond Visual Line of Sight uh, uh, trial program. Uh, as well as now working towards commercialization, which, uh, which we started uh, earlier in 2019. So you mentioned that you developed three different types of drones. So what, do you use these drones in your operations or do you also use additional drones? Uh, these are the, the main three that we use. So, uh, so we have three, three that are either uh, working right now or in the development uh, to be used in the future. First one is the uh, Sparrow. It's about a 25 kilogram drone, carries about five kilograms worth of cargo and can go for about 30 kilometers. Next is our Robin XL, which is both a multi-rotor and a fixed wing drone. It carries about 11 kilograms and can go about 60 kilometers. And our third one and probably the most exciting one is our Condor, which is a converted manned helicopter. It's gonna have the capability to carry about 180 kilograms uh, to a distance of about 200 kilometers, which is really gonna be a game changer uh, for the northern and the isolated communities. You've mentioned all the different ways drones can be used, so what advantage does using a drone have over other technologies? There's several advantages depending on, on which use case we're looking at. Uh, one of the big ones is they can be cheaper. If we look at a use case such as uh, Moosini, which we did a, a trial at uh, last year, they currently use a manned helicopter to fly packages, supplies, even people from Moosini to the island of Moose Factory. And that helicopter costs $1,800 an hour. And that's whether they're taking a five, five pound uh, package or whether they're taking 300 pounds of, of cargo over. Whereas having a scalable solution of different size aircraft with different capabilities uh, is obviously more economical and we could do it for, for a fraction of the price. Additionally, from an environmental perspective, uh, some of our systems are battery only, so there's obviously uh, better on, on the environment. And, and it's also, there's some ability not only of, of what we can do, but where. If we have smaller clinics and smaller locations in northern communities uh, that currently have no capability for traditional logistics capabilities, uh, we can provide some of those services. So if you live in Moosonee, you cannot order from Amazon Prime. There's simply no way of getting the package there. And that's something we all take for granted today, that I just go online, I order my Amazon Prime, and it shows up in two days. They have such logistics challenges in those areas that the basics that we take for granted aren't available. So that's where some more drones can come in and provide some of those, uh, those solutions. If we look at Canada, we've, we've done a, a bit of a study and there's, there's, there's over a thousand communities that can benefit from, from this type of technology. So because it's Drone Safety Day, we need to ask, what does drone safety mean to Drone Delivery Canada? Drone safety, I think the key thing is it's, it's really the means 
by which we see the, the final outcome and, and the final potential uh, of unmanned aviation. Um, it's, it's key to every part of the organization and to drone operations, whether it's assembly, whether it's operations, whether it's maintenance. Um, the company has to have a built-in ingrained safety culture because without that, the re realization in the end isn't going to be what the regulator needs right? because obviously the regulator's responsibility is making sure safety uh, is maintained. So, so from a Drone Delivery Canada perspective, uh, we've developed a, a safety management system, which those in aviation understand that what an a, a safety management system in is. It's really a circular um, process of what was the problem, figure out the causes, figure out solutions, implement those solutions, and you continue doing that. And you have to do that on a daily basis, not just on things that did happen, but things that could happen, right? And so, so from a safety perspective, it, it has to be ingrained in, in everybody that's, that's part of the operation, and has to be, has to be uh, uh, the, the leadership of the company has to be proponents of, of the safety. Uh, and it's got to come before everything else. Before the business, before the testing, before the trialing, safety has to be the has to be that keystone that, that, that makes everything work. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, safety is super important. Yep. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the steps you've taken to ensure safety for you know your pilots, but also the people on the ground. Again, a big process of ours is, is our SMS system, our safety management system, which is specifically designed for potential or actual risk and, and identifying that. Um, but we have we have processes in place with regards to, say, from a pilot perspective. There's a, there's an entire training program, which we call the DDC University, where they come in and they go through literally three days of, of ground school and training. This is beyond the pilot certificate that's required by Transport right. uh, on the company's flight operations manual, our standard operating procedures, our checklist, and going through all those uh, all those activities. So training is a big part of it. Uh, we have manuals, uh, as I said, with and checklists for that side as well from our maintenance side, because it's not just those that are operating the aircraft, the, 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 the pilots, it's also the maintainers. Are they following the same processes each time uh, so that we can ensure safety? So, uh, so I think we've developed a pretty comprehensive uh, set of policies and practices and training to ensure that, uh, that our operations stay safe. Has DDC undertaken any specific public outreach programs in order to promote transparency and increase trust? Uh, we do, as I sort of mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, uh, one of our main uh, focuses when we go into a, a new location is that outreach, uh, whether it's uh, going out to, as I mentioned, the airport operators or the, or the local uh, air operators, airlines, helicopters, etc. Uh, it's also the communities. Uh, when, we, when we've gone up to, uh, I'll use an example, when we went up to Moosonee, we did a, an exposition at the school, we got the students interested. Part of our business model is once we establish the depots, Drone A or Drone Spot A and Drone Spot B, those two depots, we'd actually have local people that are actually trained by DDC being the, the handlers, people that would load the cargo, etc. cetera, uh, do some of the basic ground work, putting the, the, the batteries in, the cargo, things like that. So I think it's, yeah, from our point of view, it's important to get the community involved, get that trust going know that their needs and their concerns are taken into account. Obviously we've heard, or you may have heard that privacy tends to be a big, uh, a big concern. Uh, from, from ours it's less of an issue because we really don't have any cameras on board, so we're not taking pictures of anybody, it's just carrying cargo. But you have to build that, that level of trust in the community uh, so that the people understand, okay, this is bringing the medicine to the hospital, or this is providing this public good, um, and are we accepting of the noise and the flight routes for that public good. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, an example of a scenario in Moosonee where, and this was before we had the operation there, but where a young child actually lost their life because they couldn't get a specific medicine over to the island because of uh, poor weather, right? Whereas, uh, whereas the community might be more accepting, uh, or I would, I would argue would be more accepting knowing that there's other means and methods of getting that there. And that's all part of, you, you do that by getting the outreach, getting into the community and see what their issues and concerns are. So the COVID-19 pandemic has had, you know, its challenges and opportunities. Yep. So what has this meant for DDC? Has this mean different projects that you guys have been working on? Uh, I wouldn't say it's different projects, but it's, it's probably moving some of our intended projects uh, ahead quicker. From an aviation perspective in general, COVID's had a huge impact in a negative way. Right. But from the drone space, we're actually seeing the opposite. Lots of growth, lots of opportunity. 
Uh, we're working on a few, few projects. I mentioned the one in Moosonee. Uh, we're doing some flight tests right now for our larger aircraft that, that we'd like to, uh, or the intent is to bring to Moosonee uh, and service uh, three or four of the, the communities that are 100, 180 kilometers from Moosonee, uh, providing goods and services without that human contact. Could theoretically be loaded at one end, the aircraft goes to the other with no pilot on board, mm -hmm. so there's no human interaction, and the person on the other end can simply uh, extract the, the cargo on the other end. Which helps with the whole social distancing. Definitely mandate. with social distancing, 100 kilometers is a good social distance. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then there's two that which uh, which you may have seen recently in the news. There's one in uh, uh, in Christian Island, which is in Georgian Bay, a couple hours north of Toronto, uh, with a. Uh, we're working on that with the Global Medic, which is a uh, emergency response uh, uh, organization, uh, as well as there's one we're looking at at uh, Georgina Island in Lake Simcoe, and both of those are island-based uh, First Nations communities, where obviously the concern of COVID spread is, is significant, because many of these communities don't have the medical infrastructure uh, that we would uh, we would see in the larger cities. Uh, so less exposure means less chance, less risk of catching something, less impact on their medical uh, services. Uh, so we're looking at doing uh, uh, deliveries with our Sparrow, that's the smaller one. Uh, five kilogram uh, deliveries back and forth. Uh, currently they use ferries and, and vehicles to do some of these, but if we can if we can reduce those numbers uh, to, to lower to, to lower numbers crossing over the ferry, that obviously reduces the risk. So, so a few projects related to COVID specific and, and those would be whether it's medical samples, whether it be test kits, whether it be medical supplies, um, medical equipment, what, what have you. Uh, we're looking at, at providing those to those, uh, those two communities. And, and as I mentioned earlier, that's somewhere in, by the end of Q3, we hopefully will have both those up uh, and running in a beyond visual line of sight capacity. So. Sounds exciting. It is. Well, it definitely sounds like drones are the way of the future. How does Drone Delivery Canada envision drones to change the face of logistics and delivery? Uh, completely. <laughs> uh, I think it's going to have a huge impact. Uh, if, if we think about today, everything that's touched by the supply chain in some way or another could have the potential to have drones involved in that supply chain. Uh, we already talked a bunch about the medical ones. Let's talk about uh, a mining scenario where they need to get a part from one piece of the mine to the bottom of the pit and by car it'll take three hours because you've got to go down the windy road. Well that three hours costs them billions of dollars when the machinery is down. Or you could fly it down in a drone in five minutes. So there's medical, there's mining, there's industrial uh, complexes where they need to move parts back and forth perhaps, packages, uh, things like that. Uh, there's been some discussions about moving cannabis products because that's a secure product or moving bank notes, things that are secure, much less risk to move them by air than it is by moving them uh, via traditional put them in the back of a van kind of thing. Uh, so there's some security aspects with that as well. And then in the end there's also going to be the consumer product part, right? How do we deliver consumer products either to, um, to the stores, so say from a, a warehouse to a store, or eventually, and I say eventually, many years down the road, that model where perhaps you can go from a warehouse to an individual's property and, and deliver uh, goods or, or items that they've ordered. So, mm -hmm. so speaking on that, in, in recent decades, we've seen Canada's cities become more and more congested. Yeah. So do you see drones having a hand in you know, improving urban mobility? For sure, um, in a couple of ways. I think uh, first, first it, there's the potential there to remove other modes off the roads, right? If, if we're doing delivery using drones, well, perhaps the perhaps the, the UPS truck or the FedEx truck or the postal truck, uh, I don't know how many of those are in Ottawa, but you can imagine there's a few thousands of those driving around just in Ottawa alone. Uh, removing some of those off the street obviously makes it makes it easier. Uh, that's a, that's a very a simple solution. But if we start thinking out further, the lessons learned that we're using and that we're gaining from using drones and the management of them in this kind of uh, airspace environment, uh, that's going to go into things such as uh, urban air mobility or advanced air mobility concepts of what's called flying taxis, but, but, but the mobility of people off the traditional uh, buses and roads and, and, uh, and railway systems, things like that. Uh, the, the term I've, I've, I've heard is uh, a, mile, a, a mile of road gets you a mile of road, right? And it costs you however much, right? right. Whereas a mile of infrastructure that's going to support uh, drones, urban air mobility, Multimodal. other modes of, uh, is going to get you uh, unlimited amounts of miles that you can fly from there to different locations. 
so I think in the end it's really going to be a, it's going to have to be a, a lot of work from all sorts of stakeholders, community developments, the regulators, the operators, uh, the public have to be comfortable. Uh, but the lessons that we're learning today and, and transport's learning today from the ongoing operations are going to uh, pay dividends later on in the uh, when we get to those levels of urban air mobility. Absolutely, and you know, multimodal integration is one of the things transport is really concerned about, so that makes a lot of sense. So that covers our questions for Drone Delivery Canada. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. It was a pleasure having you here. Thanks for letting us uh, participate today. Appreciate it. The next webinars in our Drone Safety Day pre-recorded webinar series will provide an overview of drone safety basics and explore the cool and innovative ways drones are being used across Canada. Be sure to check them out as well. Got questions about safe drone operations or something you may have seen or heard during our webinars? Tune into Transport Canada's Twitter chat to be held on November 13th at 1 p.m. We'll have a group of drone experts available on hand to answer any burning questions you may have live. Drone safety is everyone's responsibility. To celebrate Drone Safety Day, tell us what drone safety means to you. Share a photo, post, or story to your social media platforms with the hashtag Drone Safety Day and check out Transport Canada's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to see what drone safety means to other Canadians.